Hello and welcome back to the iFox with Juice podcast. I am your host, Juice, and I'm here with my co-host, Rena Parsegan. Uh, doing things a little bit different tonight since uh, the holidays are coming up, end of year. We figured we'd do a best of episode, so this one might go a little bit longer than normal, but buckle in because it's going to be a fun ride. So without further ado, here's my co-host, Reen. Rena, how are you doing? I'm good. What's up? Pretty good, pretty good. So we're going to do a quick little rundown of the last UFC on Fox card, the uh, Milwaukee-Kevin Lee versus Quinta rematch. So we had a few picks there. So we went two and two that night since Rena and I had the exact same picks. So the two we got right were the first two fights on the main card. Um, Oliveira did get the quick sub over Miller. So we we basically called that one to a T. Font decisioned Pettis. Pretty pretty entertaining fight, actually, but he, he put a clinic on that kid. Actually, Pettis, I'm not sure what's going to happen with him right now because he did not look very good in that fight. And I'm still of the opinion that he's better served at flyweight, but who knows if that's even an option since they, they might shut it down. And uh, the two we got wrong, Hooker, man, we were really wrong on that one because that boy took a beating of epic proportions. That was a... Uh, Kind of, kind of hard to watch, but uh, yeah. Props to Barboza on that one. He he, he really took that boy to the woodshed. And then uh, main event, I Quinta versus Lee. Got that one wrong. I don't know if some of you saw. I tweeted, and I was quite I was quite drunk on the weekend, so <laughs> it was still celebrating my birthday. So I caught most of the fight. I did miss the first round when I first saw it, and I did think Lee won. But I rewatched it a little while ago, and uh, yeah, I, I have no issues now with I Quinta getting the decision. So. The pick was wrong there, and it was justified because I I do think that I Quinta won in the end. But um, that was our that was it. That was our picks. We went two and two on the winning track now, but still almost five hundred that we're at. But uh, and we don't have any real fights this week aside from there is a PBC card on Fox. The Charlo brothers are fighting. Uh, I uh, apologies, I don't know who they're fighting, but I uh, the Charlo brothers. If you guys haven't seen them, you should check them out. They're they're very entertaining, hard hitting dudes, and they're in the I believe they're in the middleweight division so up there with canelo and triple g and those guys so could be a could be a fun card you know get get that in while you can before family comes over and you gotta host or do your entertaining and can just hold yourself up in your room so we get that little bit of entertainment but we're gonna start going straight into the uh the best of 2018 stuff so we have like i said earlier we have quite a quite a bit to talk about um i didn't want to go with the typical best fighter best sub best ko we we are going to talk about those things but i decided to add a few little unique topics we're going to talk about uh things like best debut uh best prospect of the year best performance of the year quite a number of topics so we're just going to go one by one here and we're going to start with best debut the best debut in fighter of 2018 well before you guys say anything yes this is basically all ufc because it's what rita and i are most familiar with but also i was i scoured through looking in bellator pfl i really couldn't find anything that was of, of real note so I, we kind of just stuck with the with the ufc so starting with best debut my choice for best debut was jeff neal uh he debuted at ufc 228 against yeah 228 against Frank Camacho and he put a clinic on that kid and kicked his fucking face off. That was one of the scariest knockouts I've seen in a while and he really put his name out there. I'm very excited to see him once again and um, I believe he did it in his hometown too. At least in his home state, because I believe he is from Texas. But, uh, uh, Reen, what are your thoughts and what's your uh, what's your pick for best debut of 2018? I actually have to agree with you on this one. Um, he's only 28 years old. Um, he's a waiter by day. Did you know that? Like he works like 40 to 50 hours, and then he goes and trains. I, I did see that he was a waiter. I did not know he worked that much. I'm, I'm not surprised. You know, a lot of upcoming fighters, uh, up and coming fighters. I'm sorry, have day jobs i just didn't think especially with waiters you know sometimes they're part-time or they work half week or but man if he's getting a foot wait <laughs> i've never waited tables in my life i've talked to many people that have and i know that it's no picnic so for him to be doing that and training and looking as good as he as he does that kid is committed and i didn't know he was i knew he was pretty young but 28 yeah that is that is pretty young still man that, yeah he's still like not in his prime he's and wow he's had subs he's had knockouts like yeah. he's he's an exciting fighter so yeah he's definitely one to watch i think he has a fight coming up in february is it 
I think January or February. I think, yeah, one of the ESPN cards, I believe. I, I forget what it is, but wherever it is, I, I will seek it out. I don't care who the guy is. I'm almost certain that I'm going to go with Neil, regardless of who it is. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very excited to see him again. That he's It's been a while since a guy, his first fight in the UFC has impressed me that much. And that kid was firing on all cylinders from the, from the minute they said go i was i was beyond impressed with that kid so yeah keep keep a lookout if you guys haven't seen him yeah fight pass go back and watch ufc 228 and he was a uh, on the prelims but he fought frank camacho watch that fight because it's it's only two rounds but it's just pure excellence from from beginning to end and the end was quite brutal if you like knockouts that's the fight for you Check it out. Um, we're going to move on from that. We're going to talk about prospect of the year. Um, there's some good contenders. I I, I debated. Um, I was going to go with, uh, I thought of uh, Aaron Pico, but, you know, he's still young and he technically made his debut last year in Bellator. So um, he did look very good. But one other guy that also stuck out was uh, Ray Cooper the third. I forget how old he is, but he beat the shit out of Jake Shields twice in the PFL. Uh, that's the only other guy outside the promotion that really caught my outside of the UFC that caught my attention. But for prospect of the year, given his record, how he came in and where he's at now, I'm going to go with Israel Adesanya. It's a bit odd even calling him prospect of the year, calling him a prospect because he came in with some hype, not many people knowing him, and he ended the year as a top contender. And then he's going to fight uh, Anderson Silva next, presumably for a title shot. So in one year and in less than five fights, he's a uh, he's world title bound. So that's my pick for prospect of the year. Uh, Rain, how about you? Same for me too. Also excited to see him. Um, it was this time last year, around this time last year, um, at MA, MMA Junkie Studios. Um, I was actually out there in Vegas for the Chris Cyborg Holly Home fight. I was going kind of nuts. I, I don't really get starstruck with fighters, but when I see like a, you know, Israel Adesanya or Joe Schilling, I, I just go, I go crazy. When I saw him, I was like, oh, wow. You know, it was really cool to see that. And then in February, he debuted and he's just been on a run ever since. So you knew Adesanya from from kickboxing, from yeah. Glory, I assume? Yeah, watching him from Glory kickboxing. And yeah, I was out there with Pam and Sam and Ali and the whole crew was out there. And I turn around and look, and I was like, oh, my God, that's Israel Adesanya. I'm like, I'm like tripping out. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I totally fangirled out. But yeah. February he debuted 2018 and he's been on a run ever since and I guess he's going to be fighting his hero pretty soon so yeah I'm looking forward to that fight. I don't know what more can be said about Israel though. I'm kind of jealous you got to meet him that um I I became a fan of that guy since his debut. I really didn't know much about him. I I heard some hype. I heard some some things about him the week prior to his debut and that's as about as uh, far as it got with me. But once he once he made his debut, I was like, damn, this kid's going to be a problem. But uh, I knew he'd go far. I did not think he'd uh, get to where he's at, though. I mean, that that uh, I think where I became a full believer was after that Tavares fight, the Brad Tavares fight. Three fights in, they give him a main event against not an easy guy. It's easy to say now that, oh, that was a, a tune-up fight or something. But Brad Tavares is not an easy fight for anybody. He's taken out a few contenders and a few prospects in his time. And Israel didn't lose a minute of that fight. He made it look easy. Even his grappling, he just, Tavares couldn't do anything. And then one of the, like, although he didn't really drop him or do any big damage with it, one thing that he did in that fight still sticks out with me where he grabbed Tavares' elbow. He was, like, kind of pawing with his hand. And uh, he grabbed Tavares' wrist and came up with an elbow. Uh, that was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in, uh, in recent memory. He's just a joy. He's a wonder to watch, so... Yeah, Israel Adesanya gets prospect of the year from prospect to contender to possible uh, future champion. What a what a story for that guy. Yeah, and ho I hope now people know the difference between him and John Jones. <laughs> oh yeah, because people were always saying, "Oh, he, this is the the new John Jones. He's like a a younger John Jones or whatever." Right? That was all the comparisons when he when he came on. Yes. So. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. And, and to be fair, um, <laughs> I still I I don't call him. I don't really compare him to john jones but one thing that I, I i totally get about that is not just that yeah he he throws a lot of nice kicks and he is similar to john jones in his style a bit but obviously we know the difference john jones does not have that level of striking as good as the striking is it's nowhere near that but i i do get it because it's gonna sound 
kind of racist, but I, I do mean this. They, they do look kind of look alike. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> they do kind of look alike. And and it's not just, they do have some, a bit of the, the face is a little bit different, but the, the, the build for sure. Tall, tall, skinny, lanky, black guys, you know, and. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the legs. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, honestly, especially to the way that Adesanya throws kicks, he throws them very similarly to John Jones. Um, I kind of want to say that John Jones throws them like Adesanya because he's the more accomplished striker. But uh, yeah, they do have a they do have a similar style. But if you think that John Jones can compete with Adesanya in a kickboxing match, you're you're out of your mind. That Israel's on a on a whole other level. But yeah, I'm I'm, I'm with you there. I'm with you there. These you gotta let you gotta let him be his own guy. He's definitely not just a Jones wannabe or a Jones clone. Um, so moving on, we're gonna talk about best performance of the year. Uh, the same one fight, one single performance that stood out above all the rest. And the thing that stuck out to me the most, like I can't even think of something that came close to it for me. The best performance of the year was Max Holloway. I know it's out of, I tried not to have it just be recency bias. I know the fight only happened a few weeks ago, but I mean he really put on a clinic on on Brian Ortega. I know it was competitive. I know Ortega had his moments, but it really was just that. It was just moments. It was never any real threat. One leg kick, one near takedown. I think an elbow in there somewhere. That was about all that Ortega got in that that hurt Max, that affected Max in any kind of way. Other than that, it was just all Holloway. And he put it on Ortega. Although he's they're basically the same age, he he sunned him. I mean, he he beat him like a dad would beat a stepchild, man. He he put him in his place of you're here and I'm over here. And you need to you need to come back to me with a few more fights and a few more tricks up your sleeve because you're not gonna you're not going to take me out this easily. Yeah, uh, Rain, your your thoughts on that or your pick for performance of the year? Okay, so I had that on my list because, man, that was just an epic performance. But I also have Dillashaw versus Garbrandt, too, on my list. So, yeah, I, I can't, that- I can't, I can't fight you on that one. Yeah, that's that's a good pick. If you had to pick one, though, well, t- talk about Dillashaw and Garbrandt since. Since that is your pick, since that is a uh, something that came up, but yeah, uh, yeah, tell, that tell me your a, pick. Yeah, that was just a great fight. I mean, from the build up, you know, we had all the bad blood. Even the first one, I mean, everything was rolling back into this one, and then he just completely dominated Garbrandt. You know, it was better than the first fight, and he actually finished it in the first round at what like four minutes and ten seconds in. So. Yeah, and and it wasn't just that he beat Garbrandt; he beat him up in like what three minutes four minutes like Mm -hmm. it's it's rare usually a first round finish means you either got i don't want to say luck because you know submission knockout there's obviously a lot of skill in most finishes but uh, he did what he did in the first fight but better and quicker yes that's what was that's what makes it more impressive because it wasn't like he and you can tell Garbrandt kind of was trying a different approach I think he was trying more leg kicks yeah he tried to wrestle a little bit more so Garbrandt didn't come into this trying to just swing with TJ Uh, I think it was obvious that his emotions got a little too high at one point but that you know that's on him the whole point is that TJ kept his cool and beat him even worse yeah now we're at a point with Cody where it's like what's what's next for him because he he was so good not too long ago, but he obviously is never going to beat TJ. And the way TJ is looking right now, I don't know who's going to beat him either. Yeah, we haven't seen Cody since, you know. Yeah, I mean, that was what, three, four months ago? I mean, that was August. Yeah, it was August. I mean, it wasn't yeah. that that long ago, but still, um, uh, he he probably should take the time too, because uh, it wasn't a brutal knockout and it was a quick finish, but still, still quite a quite a beating. I know they said that he might step in to fight. Uh, Lineker now that Dominic Cruz come out yeah but I don't I don't know if I don't know if that ever I don't know if they ever confirmed it or denied it I I still don't know if Lineker even has an opponent but I wouldn't look too forward to that for uh, Cody because I think that's just a really bad style matchup yeah even if he wins um, he's gonna get beat up and it's not gonna be easy no Lineker's too hard to stop he's he just keeps coming at you he'll eat some punches too so good luck with that one so are you are you decisive with it um are you gonna go with tj for the for for the performance or with uh with max i think i'm gonna go with tj on this one 
Yeah. Okay. What are, what are your thoughts on the on the Max fight? That was a good fight, but man, Doctor Stoppage in the round four. I actually call that one too. I keep repeating that. I yeah. call that one. <laughs> yeah, it is impressive because how many people? It's easy to. This is the thing. I'm gonna go on a bit of a tangent here, but this is the reason why I never fully understood why Connor became as big a star as he did, and then I realized like people were like, oh, um, yeah, of course he talks shit. Yeah, he just flashing stuff. Like, oh, he would he would call the rounds. You know, he said, I'm gonna knock him out in the first round and knock him out in the first round. But I'm like, that's easy to say, especially with the way that that Connor fights. He's he's a fast twitch guy and doesn't have a lot of cardio. So yeah, you better not knock him out in the first or second because that's your only your only real options you know but to say i'm gonna finish i mean not just you that called it in the fourth holloway called it in the fourth too that's way more impressive to me because you're just feeling it. it's like i'm saying i'm saying it and i'm doing it and he did man yeah yeah that's oh. crazy that, yeah. That's much more impressive to me. And I'm not trying to be biased because I love Holloway and stuff. Like, I'm trying to be objective about that as possible. And, uh, yeah, I, I think it's more impressive to call your shot as it's happening during a wild fight. Mm-hmm. And go in, oh, in first round. And, by the way, just, just to add on to that with Connor, Connor's been wrong quite a few times. So this whole Mystic Max shit <laughs> is really throwing darts in the dark. And luckily for him, they just end up landing most of the time but it's not something that he can predict these things as he says yeah well with that i'm still on the fence about that fight with max and brian because like i said before like i i think he had no business being in there not with max i thought it was too soon so i think that's the reason why i don't think it's as it's as impressive it's like i expected max to do that yeah okay so um well what about tj and cody did were you going into the rematch as this can go either way it seemed like a lot of people did yeah it was either way like i had no idea and then he would finish him almost the same in, in the same fashion as he did you know in part one yeah um i saw i saw that fight live full disclosure as i think i've said a few times um through tweets through other podcasts and stuff that i'm not a fan of tj or cody uh but people in staple center were psyched for that fight i was so shocked like wow really you guys are into this fight that much? i basically just went because i had the money and because there's a ufc in my backyard i'm gonna go but uh yeah i mean i enjoyed the fight it was quick it was violent the only thing i said before the fight had people were around me hey who are you going for man i said i really don't care i don't like either of them but i just hope it's violent and sure <laughs> enough sure enough i got my wish so i'm, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna complain that was violent and it was impressive uh, I, I did rewatch the fight a few times like i was kind of baffled by how dumb cody was of how emotional he got at, yeah. at one point but i i understand it but still like well that that's what happens yeah but still the for the uh, tj to keep his cool like that i mean you could tell he was just steps ahead uh steps ahead of him he already knew what he was going to throw um I, I don't think it's just a matter of that they practiced and they sparked together it's like he knew his mindset you could tell looking at him like yeah i know what you're gonna do i know you're mad you're gonna throw a right hook or you're gonna throw a left hook and he just just and then the fact he caught him with the same punch three times. Oh God! Yeah, yes. he ended up finishing him with knees and and stuff along the fence. He he clobbered him. But the thing that really got it started was right hook. He threw three right hooks in a row as Cody was throwing his. It's just like, yeah, I know you're gonna keep throwing it. I'm gonna keep throwing mine, and I'm gonna get you. Watch because you always put your hands down and you're always way too reckless. And that's exactly what happened. That's yeah. he in the same punch that he caught him in the first fight too. He knocked mm-hmm. him out with a right hook in the first fight, and he basically knocked him out with three right hooks in the second fight. Right. Yeah. It's like they never change up their game plan. But yeah, I probably will get a lot of hate because, you know, I go to that UFC gym. Oh, yeah. you're out of favor. <laughs> so, well, you know what? You got to call it like it is. And I, yeah. yeah, I remember we. this is before we started a podcast or any of that. But I remember I reached out to you after that. And even you were like, <laughs> exactly what you said. But you were just like, Cody needs to get his head back in the game, basically, kind of thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was it going was for evidence. PJ. Oops, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Sack. <laughs> <laughs> well, T- well, I think I know TJ's uh, training here now, but I think it was born. I was born in California, but I don't remember if it was. He's North- up here in nor in Northern California. God, I forgot which town now. Well, he he came from a little town up here, so I know Angels Camp is. I think where he grew up, but I don't know. If yes, there. yes, I think so. But yeah, it's kind of Stockton area, right? Yeah, it's yep, it's in North Cal, so. And then of course, you know, he was training in Sacramento, you know, Alpha Male and I've been in that gym and 
<laughs> Some of the coaches train at the Uriah Faber UFC gym, but oh, well, I got to say how it is, <laughs> you know? Good on, good on Rain, always, always doing her thing of calling it like it is. That's why I got you on. So that was the performance. So I, I picked Max over Ortega. Uh, Rain's got TJ over Garbrandt. In the rematch, uh, we're going to move straight on to comeback fighter of the year. I was thinking of fighters that weren't doing so hot in 2017 and came back and had a good year in 2018. But the people that stood out to me most weren't exactly in that category. I ended up going with Yair Rodriguez for my comeback fighter of the year. He only had one fight in 2017. 20- no, I'm sorry. He had two fights. He, I forgot he clobbered BJ Penn and then got shit kicked by Frankie Edgar. But it's not that he was coming off a loss and ended up getting a win. Far from it. I mean, you fill in the lines. He was on an extended layoff after the Frankie win. And plus he just, he got beat down the his well, what was it, Rain? His was it his orbital bone that got broken? Right, that those images. Yair, when he fought Frankie, remember he? Oh God, yeah. I, are they? Oh yeah, they stopped the fight because yeah, yeah. They were swollen shut. Yeah, that was that was disgusting. But you know, he 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 got injured with that, and then he took some time off, and then he took more time off, and then it's like, well, what's happening with Yair? And then. Dana saying that he was turning down fights and then he accepted a fight and then he got fired. On he a day got- off. <laughs> <laughs> I had to add that again. <laughs> he got he seriously got fired and then got took his got his job back what a few days or a week later. Yeah, they allowed him to shop around and then he came back. Yeah, I mean the whole thing was he was supposed to fight the beat on the what was it on two twenty eight USC two twenty eight and he pulled out and then you know they kind of had enough of his shit that I are right, you're just never gonna fight again you're just not interested in this and then Frankie Edgar gets hurt while he was supposed to fight Korean Zombie on the twenty fifth anniversary Denver card it was a free card but man it was a gigantic so Yair takes a last minute fight against the Korean Zombie I don't even know how many people are willing to fight Korean Zombie with a full cap much less on a few weeks notice at elevation on one of the biggest cards of the year he fights him was getting out pointed had his had his moments here and there but was getting out pointed and and maybe the flukiest shot in mma history throws a no look upwards elbow as korean zombies running in and knocks him dead with a second left in the like you couldn't write this shit Nobody would ever believe it. This this is one of the most craziest things I've ever seen in my life of, of what uh what happened. But he's comeback fighter of the year, not because he came off a loss and won, not because he came off a bad loss and won impressively. People were shitting on Yair so badly. You know, people started calling him a pussy and a bitch and a coward because he didn't he pulled out was a beat and didn't want to accept all these fights i mean even dana saying things along those lines he had such a big fan base and then it seemed like in 2018 they just abandoned them because they were getting tired of him but after that that fight with a uh, korean zombie everyone in the world even if you were never a yair rodriguez fan like everyone became a fan of his instantly so i i don't know who can who has a better come back than that from coming from basically the lowest of lows everyone doubting you everyone shitting on you losing your job coming back having one of the craziest fights of the year if not ever and having one of the greatest knockouts easily of all time what <laughs> sorry i kind of went on a match it there but uh what what is your pick i'll just leave it there what's your pick for a comeback fighter of the year well i had thought about Yaya or two but i was also thinking about tony ferguson good pick yeah I mean, he was supposed to fight Khabib back in April. Next thing you know, we get this message or Twitter blows up because we find out that he's injured. He tripped on some wires and he had this massive like knee surgery. It, yeah, ripped, ripped the ACL off the bone, if I remember correctly. It's crazy. And six months, it only took him six months mm-hmm. to recover and then come back and fight Anthony Pettis. And that fight... I went actually watched that fight again. Man, that was an amazing fight. I mean, they're like, you know, pushing off the of cages and like, you know, swinging at each other and they're on the ground. They're all bloody. And I mean, it was a war and it was a fun fight too. It was a war and a fun fight at the same time. So for him to come back and actually take those leg kicks from Anthony Pettis, I mean, that scared me. Oh, that's right. I forget. Remember? I was like, 
the first thing he threw at him, right? And they were hard to – Pettis isn't, like, a, a real well-known leg kicker, but I remember he was, like – He was going after that. Yeah, and it was almost like, I just need one good one, and you're fucking done. And Ferguson just ate him. I mean, mm-hmm. I still – yeah, I don't know if there's a, a, a more mentally hard, mentally prepared person than than Tony Ferguson. He, it's funny that I mean he has an incredible fights, obviously, and he's always has like a fight of the year contender somewhere down the line. But I remember one of the things that like freaked me out about him, like seriously, where I was like, "Damn, this guy's terrifying." It wasn't even a fight. It wasn't even like Lando Venata, you know, him coming back from getting head kicked and shit like that. Like, obviously, that shows tremendous heart. But one of the things that always freaked me out was I think I was watching one of the countdowns and he would he would get in ice tubs and would never make a sound like wouldn't breathe hard, wouldn't wouldn't scream, wouldn't shriek, wouldn't shiver, nothing. He'd just get in, close his eyes. And he reminds me of like the the that infamous image it was the the cover of the rage against the machine album with the monk on fire not moving not screaming not doing anything like that's what he's like when he gets into the ice bath like just totally stoic and that's when i realized like man this this guy's mind just goes somewhere else he has something that like 99.9 percent of people even fighters don't have he's he's out of his mind yeah he was smiling i mean he was eating those leg kicks those punches like and he was yeah. smiling and having a good time. And he was walking Pettis down. I'm like, wow, six months, that's it? And you're back and you're dominating? Yeah, and the other thing, too, is that I remember, I think even I said this, was like, I wasn't mad about the fight because Pettis is obviously an exciting fighter. And um, I knew it would be a good fight. But I also thought it was like, I thought it was kind of a weird fight because Pettis isn't exactly a top contender at this point. So I was like, man, are they giving him a tune-up fight? Or is this just, are they punishing Pettis because he'd been acting kind of diva-ish, for lack of a better term, this year? Like, I, I didn't fully get it. And once the fight, you know, happened, like, Pettis had a lot to, to offer, obviously. But, yeah, I mean, he, he was way meaner in that fight. He's been, he was way meaner in that fight than he has been in a long time. And um, yeah, he you could tell he really wanted it. And then, of course, he dropped them in the second round. And Tony being Tony did that weird cartwheel <laughs> flip thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was it was just fun. And then that when he was bleeding and sticking his tongue out, and he had him on the ground and shit. I mean, Pettis lost his mind there, too. And he I don't know if it was him or Duke that uh, you know they called the fight because he broke his hand. But to be fair to him, he's broken his hand so many times, too. So. Yeah, it was Duke. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and you know, you know, he trusts them and stuff too. But yeah, yeah when you, you have that many injuries, you you really got to be careful because you never know. You, you could hit a nerve. You can maybe even do some permanent damage to it. So yeah, I, I was I wasn't even mad that they called the fight, and he was getting beat up too. Yeah, that was yeah. a fun fight, but I think people forget about that fight because of you know the Khabib McGregor. Yeah, situation. all the stuff that happened in the, on that card too. But yeah, that was such a yeah. I, I did lose my mind during that fight. That was crazy and i know could i know i'm sorry not could be i'm sorry i know tony has uh, his share of haters but i dare you to see that fight and not be happy for him you yeah know, that, that was that was such a and then him i think he cried afterwards right in the cage like he was just so emotional sitting down yeah him and eddie bravo had a little moment and, yeah yeah, yeah I re- they didn't really focus on it but i remember him and i i just i remember feeling it like man he he probably thought his career was over when his uh AC uh honestly you know I mean it, it was that severe that it went off the bone like even if you come back are you ever gonna be the same and he looked probably better than ever against against Showtime yeah and I wasn't really a fan of Ferguson because he kind of disrespected Chris Cyborg so we'll talk about you- that probably in a different conversation okay, <laughs> when we I, talk I'm about definitely- her. I oh. definitely got to drop this down because I'm unaware of this. So we yeah. have Cyborg coming up for uh, next week. So yeah, maybe we can yeah. touch on that then. Uh, but. Touch on that then, but <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, just it was cool watching that fight. So I'm gonna go with Tony Ferguson. I don't hate you that much anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's saying something because you know us MMA fans can be stubborn. Once we hate someone, you kind of just carry that. <laughs> yep, for sure. <laughs> yep. I actually, on a bit of a side note, I'm um, someone was making lists like, oh, top 10 fighters that it's okay to, to hate. And um, 
almost every fighter I put on the list, I was like, wait, what's your what's your problem with so and so? What's your problem? I tended to go with people that were truly heinous, you know, the Greg Hardy types and the people who've done some awful, awful shit. But uh, it seems like people always had always had an issue with someone that I put. So yeah. Anyway, so moving on. So we're gonna talk about best card of the year now. I ended up going with UFC 228. That was the uh, Dallas card, Darren Till and uh, Tyron Woodley. Uh, I mentioned earlier Jeff, Jeff Neal's debut. That was on that card. So this one, from top to bottom, I, I can't think of a like a bad fight on that card. There was a Aljamain Sterling got that Sulu F stretch, as did Sabit. Jeff Neal, obviously, as I already mentioned, the 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 knockout that he got, and then what a, I think a lot of people slept on. And this for sure, if you have not seen it, you definitely need to go to Fight Pass and check this out. Irene Aldana versus uh, Lucy Purilova. That fight was insane and maybe the women's fight of the year. That was absolute madness, man. That's one of the craziest fucking fights I've seen in a long while. That was on that card too. And then the main card, I remember, was just pure violence. Uh, it was uh, some quick knockouts. As I said, there's a beep. Uh, submission. Jessica Andrade sending Carolina Kovakovich to fucking Pluto with her right hand. Uh, the main event, Tyron, Tyron Woodley was a underdog against Darren Till, you know, coming off of a long layoff himself. Darren Till was just looking really good up until that point, and Woodley never gave him a shot. He he wrestled them early. Second round, dropped his ass with a giant punch, elbowed him nearly to death, and then got Honestly, maybe one of the best star chokes I've ever seen in my life. I can't think of a of one that sticks out right now that may be better than that one. That was one of the cleanest star chokes. I mean, Tony Ferguson could do no better. Honestly, I'll, I'll give him. I'll give him. I'll give Tyron Woodley that respect that he's on that level on that night with that choke. That was elite of the elite stuff. Uh, what say you, Reen? I am going with UFC two two nine. That's that my is- favorite so far. <laughs> That is Khabib versus McGregor, right? Yeah, unless you know the upcoming card, the end of the year top. Yeah, five. we got one more. And there's a few top. There's a few uh, topics here where things can change, but I think for the most part, we're gonna get this right. Yeah, but yeah, UFC two two nine, and that's the card where Derek Lewis was actually losing that fight. He came back and he knocked out Volkov, and then he had that epic speech with joe rogan the hot <laughs> balls <laughs> comment so yeah that was memorable um and of course the rest of the car was awesome i mean from start to finish i mean even the prelims it was pretty exciting so yeah this is my favorite card overall for the year yeah i can't i can't think of a bad fight on that card off the top of my head yeah um, to add with to the Derek lewis thing too that that moment it wasn't just one of the biggest like funniest and weirdest mma moments of the year that was like a giant sports moment you know you know that shit was on espn on instagram on twitter like people who didn't even know about the sport weren't were aware of Derek lewis and i remember just thinking after the fight too i don't even think i heard that when it happened i wasn't paying attention as just because of how nuts i was going after that fight but that's one of the best worst fights ever and Derek Lewis in general is one of the best worst fighters ever he's really not <laughs> that good he really isn't but man he's entertaining and mm-hmm. he's just a, a great dude you know you know remember I believe it was last year with the hurricane him helping people with his big ass truck even even white guys with confederate flags and shit and for those of you that don't know he has a he has quite a bit of history with uh with questionable white folks in the south let's say he ended up going to jail because he beat the shit out of a white supremacist so that goes to show where he's come in life too not just that you know he has some money now and he's a famous ufc fighter that he uh went to jail came out a better person and even went out of his way to help people who probably would not help him if they were in the same if he was in a similar situation so yeah he's the um it's hard to not love Derek lewis but he is i mean he's just a character he's a character all around and he's a he's a very funny character he's a very kind character but man it's 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 really just above all it's just hard not to love the guy yeah he's a national treasure he really <laughs> is man 
that's so the best fun. way to put it. Yeah, his speeches are awesome. Um, uh -huh. I think last year, too, a lot of us uh, media people, we were actually hitting up McDonald's to sponsor him or give him something especially during that hurricane time because he was helping all those people, right? So we were hitting up, you know, McDonald's like, hey, man, do something for him. You know, he loves McRibs. He loves McRibs. And oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah, so they finally did acknowledge that. So that was cool. And then uh, on a side note here, it's just, I know he's mentioned that, but I guess I forgot because of the hot balls thing, obviously. I mean, it was a thing on his own, but then... Uh, the thing with DC and Popeyes and then Carl's Jr. getting in the mix somehow with DC. That was the weirdest shit that Popeyes <laughs> ended up sponsoring uh, Lewis, right? And yeah. then Carl's Jr. of all places ends up going with DC. Yeah. yeah, that was that was that was a weird. <laughs> We're gonna talk about that in a minute because there, there's plenty to be said about uh, a couple of cards this year and a couple of moments. But okay, so that was best card. So I, yeah, I went with two twenty eight. Green went with 229. I think those will probably be on the top of most people's lists. I went with just value as far as the uh, the fights went. Uh, I know with 229, I mean, it couldn't be ignored. It's good that a card that big ended up being good on, on fight night too, not just on paper. So yeah, I'm not I'm not mad at, at your pick either, Green. 228, 229. Yeah. Blood, sweat, tears, humor, like they had it all. <laughs> And then the drama yeah. at the end, like, what yeah. the hell? <laughs> so. so next up, we got best submission. So, yeah, I'm just going to say it. Uh, Zabit Magomed Sharapov, his, I don't even know what to call it, his modified Suluev stretch. Man, what? Oh, man, I'm forgetting the guy's name. I'm so sorry. I, I'll, I'll look it up in a minute. But his Suluev stretch of uh, that guy he fought on 228. It was so remarkable. It was the last thing anyone expected. Not just because the submission's rare, but even the way he got it, you know, he, he started out wrestling him the, like the second round. And uh, you saw he was getting dominant position. He was working his way something. And then, you know, he ended up getting his back. So naturally, as most people are like, well, he's going to get a rear naked choke. Or if he's feeling really feisty, he might go for an arm bar. No, somehow he locked him up and ended up going for his leg and uh, got a tap from a Suluev stretch like, Man, the, the 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 balls more than anything to, to think of that, to pull that off, the creativity. I don't care that it's not on the highest ranked opponent, just that that shows his mindset. And that's the thing that impresses me about Zabit more than anything. It's not just his skill, it's his creativity and his gamesmanship. You know, he's a he looks like a very nice, humble guy, but when he gets in there, he has like a Muhammad Ali. Anderson Silva, Conor McGregor, like he has like this belief in himself and the showmanship. Like he doesn't say much, but he he's one of those guys that definitely lets the fighting do the talking. And yeah, that was that was beyond impressive. Uh, what's your pick, Rena? My pick is heavyweight fighter Alexio Olenek. Alexio Olenek, yeah. Yeah, I, I always pronounce his name wrong. <laughs> um, he it is so weird. Yeah. Um, so he submitted Junior Albini um, with an Ezekiel choke. And this is his second one. He actually owns the first one, too. He did it in 2017. Um, but with this one, he actually grabbed the neck while standing. And Albini trips him. And Albini ends up on the, you know, the dominant position, or so he thought. And next thing you know, he's just grabbing his neck slow and he locked it in and he taps. It was crazy. Like he grabbed him standing. And then, yeah, Albini made a mistake. He actually tripped him. And yeah. So, I, I can, okay, I think I remember because I was having a hard time remembering this. You you'd mentioned this earlier off air. And I was having a hard time remembering it because I kept thinking about the one last year where the guy got the mount on him. But yeah, I think that's why I, I, I it, it went over my mind was, yeah, he tried. It seemed like he tried to do it standing, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And he then he tried to do it standing. He was grabbing his neck. Next thing you know, Albini trips him down. So he tripped him trying to, like, okay, you're going to get off because you're going to fall to the floor. Mm -hmm. Just going with him, right? Yep. So he's like, all right, cool. And then just locks it in. And he taps. Man, Alexia. <laughs> Round one. That's another character, man. Lex Alexia Linick. Like, I don't think that guy speaks a word of English, but another guy lets the fighting do the talking, but he's what, like 45? He's fucking ancient. Yeah. 40 and he has like 80 something fights or something. <laughs> 
Yeah, something like that, like 70 fights. He was actually cut up and hurt in that fight, too. I forgot about that part. He was cut up and hurt, and then, yeah, just desperation. I think he grabbed him standing. It was crazy. Just stereo. And then um, that was this year, too, I believe, when he submitted Mark Hunt, right? I think he got him to the rear naked. But I remember I was so impressed in that fight because he damn near knocked Mark Hunt's head off with a punch. Mark Hunt just ate it. He didn't even stumble, but I was like, I remember seeing in that fight, like, man, this dude could crack. So he he has those hands, man, but he, he just, he threw it at the wrong guy. Mark Hunt, you need a sledgehammer to knock that fucking guy out, you know? But uh, yeah, I, I, I forgot about this uh, this Albini sub. And the fact, yeah, because there's one thing last, I mean, when he did it the first time, it was very ballsy, obviously. He let the guy mount him so he can get it. But this one is like, like you said, he was he was desperate. He was kind of trying to get his things, trying to get his mind right. And in, in trying to be defensive, I'll be he fucked himself over. Yeah. That's I crazy. guess I guess he's done that eleven other times or something. <laughs> just eleven times. Yeah, just eleven, but yeah, two in the USC, but yeah. yeah. Nine other times. It, yeah, I think he's done it at least ten times for sure. Yeah, I think you're right about crazy. that. Crazy man. So yeah, heavyweight fighter doing that, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, because especially like I said, he he has power and most heavyweights rely on their power just hey, I'm, as long as I hit him, I'm good. Mm-hmm. He prefers submissions and he goes from and he's strong as shit too. Like Alexia Lenox, like the perfect example of dad strength. You know, it's just just some grown man and strength and he's russian so he just has that tinge of fear you know he's yeah. kind of intimidated by him yeah he's he's a he's a character he's a character in all the reasons that in all the ways and all the reasons that Derek lewis is not but i appreciate them both <laughs> yeah, yeah he but, has a very nice nick like i squeeze it yeah <laughs> Yeah, and it's also too. I know Mark Hunt doesn't have the best submission defense and best grappling in the world, but man, he submitted him easily. He didn't even struggle. Like, man, it it shouldn't be easy to submit such a big guy like Hunt, but he's done it so many times. It's just it's like tying his shoes. He didn't have to think about it. He just did it. Okay, so that was submission. So I went with the beat over Brandon Davis. That was the guy um, I couldn't remember earlier. Sorry, Brandon. I, I do like Brandon Davis too. Uh, I, I thought he had a chance going into that fight because he's a he's a firecracker, that guy. But um, the beat really is just the, the real deal. Um, so now we're going to move on to knockout, best knockout of the year. Um, I'll let you start with this one, Reen. What did okay. you, you have for this? Man, I had two people on the list, two fights on the list. Yair Rodriguez versus Korean Zombie. Crazy elbow KO. I love elbow attack. So, of course, I picked that. But uh, I actually picked Machida versus um, Vitor, too, because of that crazy front kick that he did. <laughs> Again. so those are, those are also my top two picks. But, yeah, I'll, I'll let you continue. I'll, I'll say my thoughts in a second. That was round two going into the first minute or something. He just, out of nowhere, that front kick to the face, and then Vitor's just dead. And I think that was Vitor's last fight, wasn't it? Well, there's there's that rumor that came around a day or two ago that he's going to come out of retirement, and people started shrieking in horror. Oh, my God. Yeah, but I don't know. Vitor's Vitor's an odd guy. He always has been. Oh. You can't You can't take his word for I'm not saying to believe him, but I'm also not saying to not believe him either. Like I, I don't know. I, I hope not. Bellator is always out there. I don't. Actually, I don't even know if his contract would allow it because he just retired, and people forget that just because you retire doesn't mean that your contract is all of a sudden void. You still have to honor it if you have fights on there. But wow, I don't, wow. I don't know if Dana would allow him to fight again or if he wants him to. It's not like a Chuck Liddell situation, you know? Yeah. Well, the last KO was brutal courtesy of Machida. Yeah. He just folded. He like deaded him. And then there was Machida again bowing. <laughs> like it was a normal thing. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think of that? I heard some people say that it's kind of a although it's obviously meant to be respectful, that it just seemed kind of dickish at the end. Like it seemed almost <laughs> embarrassing. Like it was it's too- like your master, you know, it's like it was like if your 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 sensei were to do that to you and it's like, yeah, he's just gonna bow because he's a respectful martial artist, but really he could just kick the shit out of you and your whole family. Right? It was his last fight too, and then yeah. that happened and then he bowed. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> like I honestly I had a completely different opinion of a cheetah after that fight like it, it kind of changed my whole outlook on him because there's never been a moment in Machida's career where he's looked like an asshole to me 
Like he's he may possibly be the nicest man in MMA from all accounts, you know. He's he doesn't even like to hit guys after they're done. You know, he he restrains from fit, from hitting guys even before the ref gets there. I mean, he's a true gentleman. But for you to knock out a legend like Vitor Belfort in his last fight, a fight that you know, he said way in advance, this is my last fight. And you're not just going to knock him out. You Obviously, you have to win the fight. That's fine. You could have thrown a head kick. You could have thrown a liver kick. No, you got him with the fucking front kick that your homeboy Anderson Silva got him with. The exact same one. The rear foot and being a southpaw, it was a left foot. It was exactly the same. It was just only slightly worse because he didn't punch him when he fell because he was fucking dead on arrival. Oh, my God. How dare you, right? <laughs> I'm like laughing. That, that's, that's literally a kick in the face. That's, you know, kick someone when you're down, spit in my face, like all that shit. That, he didn't have to go that far, but he did. <laughs> I mean, I know you can just say he saw the opening and he took it, but like, dude, you know you didn't have to do that. You know you didn't have to do that, but you did. <laughs> oh, my God, I'm in tears. Yeah, he did look bad after. <laughs> you're right. I mean, the, the, bow, I guess the bowing is... is, is I know what it was meant for. I know he didn't yeah. mean it to disparage him, but the way that it went down and just the fact that he committed that, he committed that that heinous hate crime on Vitor Belfort's <laughs> face. Jesus Christ. You said hate crime. Come on. I mean, <laughs> the way that Anderson did, you know, he's on a highlight reel. To the day that he dies, oh Anderson was brought a foot in his face. The match made in heaven or in hell, according to Vitor. But he had to suffer it one more time before he went. Oh, man. Too funny. I think that was that comeback fight for him, too. And then he gets that spectacular head kick to the face. I think, no, I think of Matita beat. Oh, yeah, he he beat Eric Anders. That's right. But it was kind of disputed and it wasn't that impressive. And yeah. Vitor was cool because, all right, they're both old guys. They're both kind of done in a way. But then Machito was like, fuck that. So, and then, I mean, now that going back at it, the fact that he knocked out um, Randy Couture with a flying front kick on his last fight, too. Like, I think Machito just has a hard on for fucking old dudes up as they're about to retire. Oh, my God. I forgot about that. That was, I don't know, that may have been colder. That's Captain America, man. Sure, he's jerking off in front of us now, but come on. He was oh, my God. <laughs> Oh my god. So oh, we should maybe talk about that later. Um or maybe now since you brought it up, but I guess he's in a legal battle w- over that video now. Randy Couture. Yeah. I have no idea that's the first I heard of it. Yeah, because I guess the gal wasn't supposed to release it. She was recording him. So it was a girl that was I, I didn't see it. I I I have no idea about that. I didn't yeah, see I it know. either. But it was on um, Fighter and the Kid because one of the yeah. one of the interns or whoever that you know helps him out. I forgot his name. Um, they pulled it up and they were talking about it and laughing about it. And I was actually in oh. tears listening to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard clips of it. But is that the thing? Like, oh, now people are like the whole thing of like damages, like ruining my reputation and yeah, private, like all that type of shit. Yeah, well, I was hearing, well, I was listening to it yesterday, and they're like, oh, you know, we're sorry. We didn't know they were going into, you know, legal issues with this because this girl should have never released it. You know, they're calling her, you know, a douchebag for doing that. So, yeah, that girl's going to be in trouble because she wasn't supposed to do that at all. Like, he didn't know. It wasn't uh, Randy that released it. So, but yeah, they were like apologizing about it because they were making fun of him for that video. So, <laughs> I'm sorry. That, that's actually really sad. Sad, but it, it, I'm going to go out on the limb here and say, I think most 20 to 30 year olds have had their scare of nudes being leaked online or a sex tape or something that something that you don't want out. I think it's fair to say a lot of us have had that scare because this is 2018. This is what young people do. When you're in your 40s and 50s, man, this shouldn't be a fucking issue. Come on. Let, let, let the, maybe that's why I didn't want to watch it. Like I respected them enough. I was like, man. Sure, there's some gossip, some, as we say in Spanish, some cheese that can go around with this, but like, I respect Randy Couture enough to not see his dick. Yeah, I couldn't watch it either. Like, like, to, like I told you, I had it up on Pornhub. Like, I knew it. it said porn. I'm like, no, I can't press it. That's Captain America. No, 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 no. I can't. I won't be able to watch his fights the same ever again. So I didn't. So I'm glad I didn't. The expendables will have. A... Oh, Lord. <laughs> It's going to be tainted no. more than it already has. Right? <laughs> it's yeah. already tainted with a bunch of steroids, but 
<laughs> They're not fighting for real, so it's okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, anyway, so um, so I let you go with that. So okay, so you pick Machida, and you had mentioned Yair, and uh, yeah, as I said too, those were my top two picks, and uh, but my number one is Yair. We, I had mentioned it already with the comeback fighter of the year, but just to talk about that elbow, I mean, talking about Zabit and his creativity. It's no su- surprise that Yair is a creative, wild motherfucker. We've seen that since his UFC debut. But, man, it, it, you know, it's one thing with his kicks. We all know he's a Taekwondo guy. He's got amazing kicks. You know, his boxing's not all there. and he, It got better. It did improve with the Korean zombie fight. But that elbow is... Here's the thing. Talking about it on a technical aspect, it was it really was so fluky. Not just because it hit in the last second. Not just because it was so awkward. Not just because... Like, that's not sound to bend over at the waist, like literally where your body's in an L shape. That's not sound in any kind of fighting, but especially in, well, you know, in Muay Thai. I mean, in Muay Thai, they don't even like you to dip because you could take a knee to the face. And Yair just said, fuck it. I'm ducking down like if I'm about to tie my shoes and I'm just going to throw this little bitch up there. And he threw it and he knocked him dead with it. The chances of that happening are so minuscule, so just out there like and he threw it once before like he saw obviously some kind of opening so he never paid for it It, it's not something that any any coach is gonna see and advise his fighters to do but man how sensational like i don't know if we'll even ever see a knockout like that not just in obviously in the last second of that but i don't know if anyone's ever gonna throw that again and land the way that he landed i don't know if it can get any more brutal or more sensational or more shocking yeah he had a lot of power too like just bam like wow well um Chan Sung Jung ran face for, first into it, you know. I mean, it was partly him coming into it. Though, yeah, being careless. But say what you want about him being careless, that's the last thing he even expected to get caught with. Yeah. It looked like he ran in knowing, like, I'm going to get hit. I'm going to take a few jabs, maybe even a head kick. I'm, I'm ready to eat it so I can hit this motherfucker. But elbow coming from the pits of hell straight to your chin, There's no, there's no bracing for that. That's that's a whole other level of pain and doom. Yeah, crazy man. And then uh, just as a and it, it it got to him too. It wasn't just the fact that he lost. I mean, he was embarrassed. You know, he said like, "Man, that's the most embarrassing thing I think I've ever done or seen." Like, I felt bad. I heard that little interview a few days after the fight. Like, man, I I totally feel for you, man. Like, you had that fight in the bag, man. You had it. You had it. And I don't look at Korean Zombie any any less than I ever did. That that was insane. I may even have more respect for him, but the respect that I have for your year, I was one of those fans, as I mentioned earlier, I was one of those fans that I was never too big on him. I wasn't on, you know, I was never like this giant fan of his, but I did like him. But I was one of those fans too. It was just like, dude, get get with the program. Are you going to fight or not? Are you, why are you, like, I even looked at him like, like what a lot of people are saying, I like this new breed of fighters, like these fucking Gentiles, like they just want money fights and they just want fights that um, that'll that work out for them and easy fights and things of that nature. But he took one of the worst style matchups and one of the worst positions and one of literally one of the worst climates in Denver, you know, at altitude. And he went five hard rounds and then collapsed afterwards, too, because he had broken his foot like Jesus Christ, the heart on that guy. That's just absolutely incredible. I don't know what else I could say about that that fight and that elbow, but that, that blew me away. That there's nothing else I can say that that blew me away. Getting closer and closer, so that was the best knockout of the year. Yeah, year Rodriguez for me, Leota Machida for Reen. So we're gonna move on to best fighter. So my pick for best fighter is uh, Daniel Cormier, becoming the second champ champ in UFC history and um, becoming the first. Uh, the first fighter in UFC history to defend both titles. Um, he started the year by by uh, TKOing Volkan Ozdemir. He ends up fighting Stipe and knocking him out in the first round to get the title, and then he submits uh, Derek Lewis at the end of the year to to get his first title defense. So that's uh, that's my pick. What's your what's yours, Ring? Same. Yeah, I mean it's really hard to go any other way. I think. Yeah. You know? I mean, the only other person that kind of came to mind, especially that I was trying to think outside the box, was was Gegard Mousasi because, you know, he left the UFC and he won the title and then beat Roy McDonald. But, you know, I'm sorry to say I I like Mousasi. I am a fan. But the fact 
especially with Rory, the way that he went down, I, I wasn't impressed. I wasn't impressed by Rory, and in turn, that kind of damaged Musasi's performance a little bit. But that's the only guy I could think of that had such a had a good run and so impressive wins. But DC, I mean, he did he did the unthinkable. You know, him beating Stipe it wasn't out of the realm of possibility, but to knock him out in the first round, knock him out out cold, you know, not not even really. He used his wrestling to get the punch, but he never slammed him. He never got top position on him. He just, you know, swung that right hand. It landed and two or three on the floor, and that was it. And then taking the Derek Lewis fight on a few weeks' notice, just just for a payday, just for the fuck of it, save the event, which not a lot of fighters are willing to do. Just that gamer mentality deserves some respect, I think. I think so too. Not only that, just what he does outside of the cage too. I mean, he's doing you know commentary, he's doing all this you know analyst work, and then he's up here helping the kids wrestling team and Gilroy. Gilroy, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, so he's doing all that and. And he's still at AKA. training. Yeah, at AKA training. And he's still doing the thing. He's still winning in two different divisions. So I mean, you gotta just give it to him. Yeah, and I mean he's gonna um he's gonna retire soon too, if you believe him. So to do these things basically in your last year of competition, you know, that that's not the way it goes for most most people. And mm-hmm. in any in any field of work, but especially fighting. I mean, he's thirty nine. You know, and yes, obviously he's lost before and his only loss is to to John Jones and one of them was sketchy. You know, yeah. But <laughs> but man, like how and we're going to talk about this soon. If we don't talk about it right now, we're going to talk about it next week with uh, with that man, John Jones, fighting next week. But it's crazy. It's a uh, there's still some people who will not give DC his credit, but I think they're in the minority now, whereas even a year ago, they were probably at least maybe half of the MMA fan base, if not the majority. Now it seems like he's really turned the corner and people are, are liking him. Yes. Uh, and I don't know if it's just because Jones doesn't get the fucking picture and will not stop fucking up and they people gave up on him. I, I really think and I really hope that it's because people just acknowledge DC's greatness and his achievements. I think it's both. The Stipe fight definitely helped. And then I think just the humor behind the Derek Lewis fight going into that. <laughs> you know, I think we got to see like the fun side. Yeah. DC. And everybody else got to see it too, you know, so. And the other thing with the Stipe fight too is that he beat the best UFC heavyweight ever. Possibly one of the greatest MMA heavyweights ever. Yeah. In one round, you know, and and you know, you got to remember he beat Ozdemir in, on that UFC 220 card, but Stipe beat Ngannou. And this is when Ngannou was fucking the, probably the most terrifying man in UFC history. He he schooled him. He he took a, you know, he put a clinic on him. And DC still, still, man, he smashed him. And he and it's not like he was doing great. He was he he was losing that round. Honestly, he had his moments. He was doing he was doing okay, but he was losing. And what thirty seconds left in the first round, clips him and finishes him. But you know he wasn't looking great, and yet he still finished him. You know, in, in a heartbeat. That wasn't it like an uppercut and a clinch, and then next thing you know, a right hand right dropped him. Um. Yeah, he was going for like that. Yeah, like that dirty boxing thing, and then he tried to kind of he kind of faked like a takedown. He kind of went for like an underhook type thing, and Stipe did like the right thing of backing away and kind of pushing him off. Uh, but as he was doing that, uh, DC pushed him and threw him right in the line of fire of his uh, overhand right, and that's what that's what dropped him. So crazy, man. They did just that too. The the, the what the finish with Stipe, like the the knowledge and the intuition to you know, obviously you can tell that he he thought about that. It wasn't just like some random thing of like he he failed on a takedown attempt and just threw a punch. Like you could tell that he was thinking about it and probably even drilled it in practice. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, we're both in agreement there. Best fighter DC. I mean, ES- was it ESPN named him what like in the top ten of like athletes of the year and stuff? Like, good, I- wow. Yeah, I forget what the number was, but he was up there. Like he was above, I think even like LeBron and like 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 big name athletes. I was like, wow. But even they couldn't deny it. Like you know, they could have put Khabib or someone who I mean, you know, Khabib beating Connor and shit. Like that could that's impressive. But no, they put DC like. They didn't just go with well. Everyone knows who Connor is. Everyone knows who these like. They went with the guy who 
who earned it, who who really put the work in, and props to ESPN for that too. Yay! Finally, MMA getting some recognition. Yeah, legit. You know, especially now with Mayweather's coming back. So we. What? we <laughs> <laughs> oh shit! We could talk about that next week too. Oh my god! Okay, next week should be fun. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, because he's fighting what a day or two after Jones, so yeah, that could be insane. Yeah. Supposedly, allegedly fighting. Well, okay. So I'm gonna have you. Did you see? I don't know if I I linked it to you. Did you see that video of him getting his head rubbed? Mayweather, who's gonna yes. <laughs> did you see that thing like caption this. Yes. And I I think I was like, how can I sue Ryzen if tension head kicks me? <laughs> Oh, come on. You know he's thought about it. Maybe not at that moment, but man, I hope he's smart enough to think about it. I bet there's a clause in there or something. Yeah. But then again, it's the Japanese. They didn't honor, you know, the contract with the UFC, so we'll try. Mm -hmm. And they have... (laughs) And they have as much power and money, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, especially then. Yeah. So, okay, best fighter, DC. We're both in agreement there. Okay, so now we're getting to the juicy stuff. Uh, best fight, best fight of the year. I'll let you start on this one, Rain. <sighs> it was a toss-up between Gaethje Poye versus Ferguson Pettis. Boy, I'm going to go with Ferguson Pettis. Because, you know, that Gaethje fight, it was, it was fun. Um, he had a lot of shots. There's a lot of eye pokes. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, eye pokes stopped the momentum a couple times. I think they there's both like three or four. Right? Yeah, they both got him. Yeah. Stopped the momentum, but yeah, Gaethje wasn't really defending a whole lot. He was just eating a lot of shots, and it was just all Dustin. Um, at least yeah, with- yeah. I think he may have won what uh, if we're being fair, probably winning what maybe one two rounds if he was lucky. Right? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. So, I mean, I think a lot of people put it up on their list as their number one, but I think I have to go with Ferguson Pettis just because, you know, Tony's comeback, Pettis is there. Yeah, he's not, I don't think he was ranked or anything, right? Uh, I who, have Pettis? to check the ranking. Yeah, I have to check the ranking. Um, I, I think he was in the top 10 because he, he uh, beat Kiesa. He got that quick arm bar on him earlier in the year. People okay. were like, man, Pettis is back. I think it was like maybe like number seven or number eight. He he was he was up there, but yeah, he wasn't top three or top five. Top five or anything. Like yeah. Also. But yeah, that was an exciting fight just for both of them. And yeah, I'm gonna go with Ferguson Pettis as my best fight of the year. Yeah, it was I mean, I like that you said that too, because uh I think most people don't even consider fights that are not five rounds. Uh like they don't even want to consider him for fight of the year. It's like first they better be five rounds. They better be a main event or a, or a title fight. And uh, even if they they are five rounds, like it better have gone five rounds because like there's like this. I feel like a lot of people get this thing of like you got to get your money's worth. So if it was just you know yeah a, a, a two round fight is great, but a five round fight is better. Like that's not always the case. You know there's, there's been I get I remember I don't remember who won fight of the year that year. But one of my top fights that year was um, uh, uh, Ferguson versus Barboza. And they fought. That was a two-round fight. But it was absolutely insane. And then I could say the same thing about him and Venata, too. Like, that was those two-round fights. But they were insane. And they had more action than a lot of five-round fights. So I had no problem naming those. I don't think I ever named them fight of the year. But I was definitely like, if you don't think that's at least top two, top three, you're crazy. Yeah. Yeah, I, I got no issues with that. Yeah, I thought it was more technical too, a little bit more technical, throwing some elbows, you know, jumping off, you know, using the cage and throwing a punch and um, somersaulting Pettis. his way out of knockdowns. Yeah, and Pettis doing his cartwheel <laughs> kicks. And just, yeah, yeah, I forgot he threw that too. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, like it was wild. It's the fence too, right? He was like, it wasn't like he just threw it out of nowhere. I think he was getting beat up when he threw that one. Yeah, he, yeah. he threw that a couple times. So. It was yeah. fun. So yeah, I like that one. I mean, people like the brawls and the quick knockouts and this and that, but yeah. I'm more like a technical, like you have to show me a, a few more, you know, steps, yeah. tools in your arsenal. So, yeah, I'm going to have to go with Ferguson Pettis and all oh, the bloodiness of it all, too. <laughs> yeah, it was definitely it was definitely fun. It was definitely fun. And then, and, um, you know, I think you had mentioned earlier him getting leg kicked and smiling and stuff, too. But, but uh, Pettis, too, you know, sticking his tongue out. 
with the blood running down his face. And like, you could tell Pettis was having fun in there too, up until they stopped it. You know, like that's, that's a sight to see because it seems like the last couple of, uh, of uh, fights, especially when Pettis was getting beat up, like you just feel bad. Like you, like a good example, I think is the Poirier fight when Pettis fought Poirier, like that was back and forth and they went at it. But the last two rounds of that, you just, you saw Pettis just like giving up, like, Oh, I don't want to be here. You know, like you, you could see it was just tough for him. So for him to be reacting that way, is like, well, he's doing it because he loves it again. Uh, maybe something was missing, but he's definitely loving something about this fight. Yeah, he definitely had a good dance partner. They both did, so. Yeah, that that counts for a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so my pick for fight of the year is uh, is the rematch between Robert Whitaker and Yoel Romero. Um, I don't know if I've gone back. I have not watched it recently, and I don't know if I ever watched it after it happened. But I know seeing highlights, I, I remember how good it was, and I remember just watching it. It's it was rare. It was weird that I was so psyched, I was so amped, I was so emotional during the fight. Everything of how it worked, of how it played out, but also I was watching it, and I I'll be honest, I was drinking. I wasn't in the best state of mind, but I was still watching it with like a technical eye, uh, and not even really because like I wanted to like oh what are they doing what are they doing, but it was like it was at a pace where it was it was fun, it was filled with action. But it wasn't a brawl up until the third round when Romero landed that shot. You know, then after after that, they kind of went crazy. But even then, it, they you know Whitaker maintained his cool, did what he had to. Do. You know, he was throwing those front kicks. Whitaker has some of the most underrated front kicks, I think, in MMA period. He threw that head kick. I don't I remember if it was the third or fourth round. Um, yeah, he just the heart that Whitaker showed, and then he. He broke his hand again, unfortunately. You know, we're not going to see him till February. And pretty soon, I guess, in February now. But had to take a few months off after. I mean, he might have won fight of the year two years in a row. Because I, I don't remember if there was a better fight in 2017 than him and Romero the first time. But the second fight was even better. And the craziest thing about here's the here's what I love about that fight. It was nothing like the first fight. In fact, it was probably the complete opposite of the first fight. The first fight, nobody got dropped. Nobody got seriously hurt. It was just fun and technical and back and forth. A lot of grappling, a lot of defense. It was it was good. I loved what it was. But the second fight, uh, Whitaker took the initiative. You know, he, he hurt him in the first fight with those kicks to the knee and had that, you know, he just came at him like a fucking demon just with those kicks to his knee like motherfucker you're gonna you're gonna pay for what you did to me like i i that was the moment where i realized that i like whitaker even more than i than i did that he had this just that blackness in his soul somewhere like he's vengeful and i know that's probably not a good thing to say not a good attribute for a fighter to have you know the common wisdom would say something like that but that's worth a lot to me there's times where you really need something like that and that was the right time um, and he, you know, he almost paid for it. He almost got knocked out, but he showed heart and he still, he still pulled it through. I, I don't know. I heard people say draw. I heard people say Romero won. I, I, I really need to go back and watch it and judge it for what it was. But part of me doesn't want to because I enjoyed it so much for what it was with the excitement, with how technical they were, you know, how, how it turned into this crazy brawl. You know, the fact that Romero didn't get any takedowns again and really didn't try for him but a few times he did didn't get anything and he did nothing for two rounds basically and then as always third round he turns it on and then every point after that was just ridiculous so yeah Romero versus Whitaker it's my fight of the year easily the best middleweight fight ever and may even go down in my top 10 as if I had to make a list right now I may be in my top 10 for best fights uh, in MMA history that's awesome very good choice yeah i mean i was i really was in all of that fight like the again the technique the heart all that stuff but the fact that it wasn't just a continuation of their first fight that they made so many adjustments that they studied you could tell they studied each other so hard and even during the fight too you saw like they both have like they kind of had like it's it's a competitive thing you know they 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 knew that they're equal on equal footing of, of competition but you kind of see that thing in their eyes, like, I'm going to take you out, motherfucker. Like, I'm, 
they weren't friends at all. You know, like they, they really, uh, they didn't make it personal, but they really, it was about pride and honor and that type of thing without it being about, you know, shit talking and, you know, getting others involved and stuff. But it was, that was like the purest competition I've seen in a while between two, two guys like that. And, and I don't know what else I can say about it. it it's just, just awesome all around. Love it. We'll always love it. Okay, so moving on from best fight, we still got a few. We got, we're going to cover, <laughs> we're going to talk about our favorite. Okay, this isn't, this isn't best or favorites. We're just going with moment. Moment of 2018. And um, I know it's very broad. You may not, you may shake your head right now. What does that mean? So I'm thinking moment. It's very subjective. So it can be a fight. It can be a fighter. It can be some some sound bites, some shit talking thing. It can be a scandal. It can be a news story. I ended up going with UFC 223. That was my moment of the year. The whole card, the whole card, the buildup, all the news surrounding it, everything about that card was that fight week was the most insane fight week I've ever experienced in my 10 years of watching fights. Tony Ferguson gets hurt. He he tripped over wires and hurt his ACL on April Fool's Day. You know how hard that was to believe for anyone? He hurt himself on April Fool's Day. They get a week's notice replacement in Max Holloway. He was going to fight Khabib to try and become another champ champ. He's cutting weight. He had like 30 pounds to lose in a week. Cutting weight. Gun, he's you know we never found out where he was at, but they cut his they they stop his weight cut. The doctor stopped the weight cut, saying he couldn't continue. And then Showtime is supposed to fight Khabib, but you know, and then and then oh the other thing of <laughs> I forget of something that happened in between that, not just fight stuff. Conor McGregor decides to go on a rampage and throw dollies at buses, and ends up getting like three fighters knocked off the card. Showtime. I was supposed to fight Kiesa, so he was a he was there. Originally supposed to compete. Thanks to Connor, had doesn't have an opponent. Thinks he's gonna come up by fighting Khabib. He's gonna come up with this giant fight, but negotiations with money and who knows what other things didn't allow that. Then Paul Felder steps up. That would have been an excellent fight, Felder for Khabib. And then of all things, the commission says he's not ranked high enough. These bullshit UFC rankings actually matter for once one of the most crucial moments ever. And then Ali Quinta, of all people, the guy that the UFC despises probably more than everybody, ends up getting the fight of his life on a day's notice. I, Man, that's that's absolute insanity. And then to top it off, I mean, to go in the actual card, uh, that was the beat versus Bachniak. That fight happened on a, on that card. And then um, Rose number units versus uh, Yuana and Jacek happened on that card too. Like that, that's that may be. Uh, I mentioned uh, Irene Aldana versus Puri, uh, Lucy Purilova earlier. That is my women's fight of the year, but Yoana and Rose are a close second. I mean that that is legit one of the best women's fights maybe ever, definitely in the UFC. So that fight happened. That was a masterpiece. And then Khabib outpoints Iaquinta and leaves people hanging like, oh, Khabib's not that good because he couldn't finish this guy who's not a wrestler, who didn't really do much. But then as we see this weekend, Iaquinta uh, beat Kevin Lee. So maybe there was no shame in that. Um, yeah, just that that whole card, pure insanity. Um, that's the, one of the biggest news stories that I remember in MMA in general. But biggest news story, biggest scandals, biggest shock, you know, biggest shockers. I can't think of a fight that had that much drama. So my moment of 2018 is the entire UFC 223 card from the buildup to the last bell of the event. What about you, Irene? Damn, how do I follow that one? (laughs) Oh, okay. So my moment of the year is Khabib dropping Connor. In their fight. <laughs> and it continues with Khabib, so good segue. Yeah, it's so funny. I was just thinking, I'm like, Pettis was on that car. Here we are talking about this one. Here's Khabib, McGregor. 
all the characters are you know you know aligned in this card kind of but yeah that moment when he dropped and it wasn't even one of the cleanest shots or anything right it was ugly mm-hmm. and yeah he got caught with that shot and and it was even, fast and it was hard and yeah very, when i say fast i mean very fast yeah it was hard as fuck he got dropped like we had no idea that could be that had it in him right um so i think this is a significant moment for him and his team um connor's team because now kavanaugh's thinking like what's going to happen after this you got dropped you know you you lost this fight it's supposed to be kind of like your comeback you know now it's what are we going to what are we going to do now? You have all this money. Do you really want to fight? That punch may have literally changed Connor's career, too. Uh, yeah, obviously, he didn't knock him out. It wasn't like, oh, like Pacquiao getting knocked out by Marquez, where you're like, oh, shit, he may never be the same again. But, like, the shock the shock that went over people's faces, like, that wasn't supposed to happen. Mm-hmm. Like, luckily, he, he didn't get knocked out. But it's like, in what universe was Khabib ever supposed to even – honestly even touch connor like yeah we knew he was gonna uh, wrestle him and probably hit him on the ground a bunch of times but the fact that he would even land a jab on connor would would be surprising much less a wild winging and that's the other thing yeah you like you said it wasn't pretty if he would have caught him with like you know i know kabu doesn't really like throw kicks like that but like if he were just like put all his energy and focus, like I'm just going to throw this giant head kick right now and catches him at the top of the head and he stumbles. Like, it'd be shocking, but, you know, like, oh, he put it all into one shot. But he didn't even seem that that intent on landing. It seemed like he kind of threw it kind of to, like, scare him off, kind of to, like, set him up. But it landed, and it landed hard. And, it, you know, that, that, that wasn't supposed to happen. I think a lot of people... A lot of people's opinions on Connor change that they like, oh, he can be touched. You know, not not just Nate Diaz, not just because he's bigger. Like, he can be touched by guys that are even smaller than him. Yeah. So I think it's changing his future a little bit. Like, is it worth coming back now? And like you pointed out earlier, you're like, oh, check out his Twitter now. He's just talking about his whiskey and trying to sell that. He's not really even focused on doing anything else. So I wonder what's going to happen, you know. His coach is saying, let me know what you're going to do. And it has to be something big or I'm not coming back. And that brings up questions, too, of is it pure as far as the coaching goes? Is it pure? Is it like I care for you? If you're going to take a fight, make it a big one so it's worth it. Or is it coming from a a place of selfishness of like, oh, I only only want to help him when when the pay is good. That way I can you know, maybe line my pockets up a little bit more or get my name out there or get a little more recognition or whatever. Like it, it, It's bringing up a lot of drama, honestly, you know? Yeah. I wonder what's going to happen. I mean, he's been talking a lot, Coach Kavanaugh. Yeah, that, that that's a whole other can of worms with... And then oh, well, Owen Roddy, the striking coach of SBG, leaving too. He just left like a week or two ago. And he says he has no intent to come back either. Yeah, like, I guess Connor could hire him on his own and just keep him. And I, I mean, he left the gym. It's not like he has to not work with Connor. But it, another thing that someone pointed out, I noticed online, was that Connor's not really training anyway. Which is say what you want about Connor, uh, um, he kind of strikes me as like that GSP type, where like working out and training and martial arts are kind of like his therapy. Like he he does it to keep himself sane. I really, I, I know people talk shit about Connor and I, I get the hate, but I know he's a martial artist. Like he, he, he really does love fighting. And uh, I know that kind of may sound like, well, of course that's his job. He should love fighting, but a lot of fighters don't the same way that you go to work and you're doing it for a paycheck. And a lot of fighters are like that too. They don't watch other people's fights. They don't go home and cash the pay-per-view. They're just, all I need to watch is my opponent, and sometimes not even that. And I'm just going to, you know, just hammer it out and do my work in the gym. And I don't want to know anything besides fighting, aside from when I'm fighting. So he really is that that dedicated guy, at least in the past. That's what he's always seemed like. But now he's like, it looks like he's working out in his garage. 
You know, like he's just like hitting the bag and stuff. Like he's not doing anything of substance. Yeah. Well, the latest from Coach Kavanaugh, because he's been talking a lot, is Connor never spends money. Everything's given to him. Cars, yeah. clothes, everything oh. is given to him. So, well, wait, isn't the word always been that he rents a lot? <laughs> he rents suits and and mink coats and Ferraris and shit. That's at least that's what he does over here, from what everyone speculates. Well, I guess uh, who knows in Ireland? Yeah. Well, his coach is saying everything's given to him. So, if somebody's always getting something, would you really work hard? At this point, I mean, before he had to work hard, he was on welfare, his girl was working, you know, he had to make ends meet somehow. So he stuck with fighting, even though there was some fear of getting brain damage and this and that, he still stuck with it. Now that he's made his millions and he continues to receive all these things, it's like, do you have it in you to even step in the cage again? So, I mean, it's, it's interesting now that things have changed after this fight. Like his coach is talking more, I mean, about personal stuff. Yeah. You know, so. The other thing too with Connor is, um, obviously we know he at least has, well, who knows how much he's gone through it. And if what you're saying is true about him giving him stuff, maybe he hasn't used a lot of it, but we know he at least in the past 12 months had a hundred million dollars in his bank account. Thanks to Mayweather. But we don't know, and I don't know if we'll ever will know, of how much money Connor made with this fight. Because at the very least of what we can gather, I'm, I know he's had to have a minimum of $10 million. And now that's being very, very kind. Uh, that's being very, very conservative about things. Um, if last I heard, he was being paid for this fight partly as an owner of the UFC. Who knows what that means? Who knows how that works out? Uh, obviously, he had proper proper twelve on the mat, and uh, just in that alone, if we're talking about strictly money, how much money that's bringing him. I'll say this: I I uh, I was looking for that a whole week. Uh, I ended up getting a bottle of proper twelve. It was not easy to find. You know, we have a store here in a, in a Cal and a lot of the uh, Southwest here in in the U.S. called Bevmo, which is a giant retail store sized liquor store basically and they can have every kind of whiskey and wine and beer you can think of i couldn't find it i went to four or five different locations around here nobody had it i called i called obscure liquor shops and i could not find it i by some miracle i ended up finding it at some at some like armenian uh supermarket <laughs> but uh yeah that that's been selling and it's it's still hard to find. Three, two, three months after it came out, it's still hard to find. With the holiday season, you know, a lot of people are going to try and get it too. So if we're talking strictly money, he's definitely making it. But I'm, I'm wondering just how much he's making off of, off of that card. Um, he could have made ten, twelve million. He could have made fifty. He could have made another hundred million. We don't know if he really is getting paid. The way the UFC says, like, who knows what that card generated, what cut he got off of it. Pay-per-view buys, obviously, you get the points. It was 2.4 million pay-per-view buys. It was the biggest, by far, the biggest UFC pay-per-view ever. So, who knows? I mean, yeah, that punch, as I said, that punch, oh, I said his career, man. That punch may have literally changed Connor's life. Yeah, I think he signed a six-fight contract, right? And he just fought one. I think so, yeah. And he has five more to go, so it's... What makes sense now after this fight? Are they going to go after the money fight, Nate Diaz fight, or mm-hmm. GSP maybe? Because GSP had interest too, right? But Kavanaugh's thinking rematch with Khabib. That's yeah. also on the table. So I think he man. said Khabib or Diaz were the main things that he thought of that he was looking at. Yeah. That makes sense. Uh, he doesn't deserve a Khabib rematch. I, don't, I think anyone that says that is extremely biased and out of their minds. They're not looking at anything fairly. But yeah, um, I don't know. That's that's a that's a weird situation. Honestly, I mean, yeah, there's worse things to be in life than having multi, you know, multiple millions of dollars in your bank account and having the whole world know who you are. But Connor's definitely not in a great spot. Uh, financially, obviously he is, but 
career wise, especially if he's really serious about fighting, he's really got to think about some things. And I think the biggest dilemma to him is going to be do I move? Do I switch camps? Or do I retire? Because as much as he loves money, as much as he loves fame and the whole thing, his love for Ireland is undeniable. And his love for his gym, at least the way the gym was, is undeniable. Maybe not Kavanaugh, maybe not, or who knows. But maybe it's also a thing of pride, too. Like, hey, these guys built me up. I don't want to abandon them. So if I'm even thinking of this, maybe I should just call it a career because if these the guys were here with me since day one and they can't do it anymore, well, then maybe that's as much as I'm, that's as far as I'm meant to go or something. Yeah. And more money, more problems, right? I mean, oh, for sure. he's even having like mistress issues, right? He's having all these girls on the side, right? Allegedly, uh, these are all rumors. Uh, these are, and I'm not saying this just because like joking or that they're, there's nothing that can be really, really proven. But, um, I mean, he wouldn't be the first guy. He wouldn't be the first major athlete to go in raw. Mm -hmm. I, I know friends of mine who have five, six kids who are unwilling to pull out just because it, it feels so good. <laughs> so, when you have multiple millions of dollars, maybe it's not such a big deal to have a kid out of wedlock, to have a love child. But, man. I'll just say if it means anything, shame on Connor if that's true, and uh, do better, man. Because yeah, that that chick of yours is stuck by your side, and it's not like she's exactly uh, bad looking either. So, well, that was part of the whole story with him too, right? Because his lady by his side, you know, she yeah worked so hard for him. So she did, man. And that's that's to me like, look, I know people are like, well, that's personal business. You shouldn't care about relationships and what people are doing or not doing but I don't care who it is I mean especially a woman though she's by your side when shit's rough you know that's what many people talk about it's like oh well women will always say that you know they're by your side but if shit gets rough they'll leave like that's like the common idea you know it's like, oh, no, no one's that loyal but she was mm -hmm. yeah that's 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 something that's yeah. not nothing. That's something. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, 220, I had mentioned UFC 223. I guess yours, I don't know if it's a combination of just the punch that landed on Connor or maybe just Khabib in general. It's not like he hasn't been making headlines, you know, after the, and then of course there was the brawl and a lot of things that have come up with Khabib lately. So, yeah, his comments. And yeah, and then I mean, <laughs> the lightweight division. I mean, you've mentioned Ferguson and you know Poirier and all. Like, man, there's there's a lot going on in that division. And then right now, who knows what's gonna happen because Connor and Khabib can both be suspended. Who they can shit? Maybe they lose their licenses in Nevada if they're really strict about it. It can get real serious if uh, you know we can't just assume that everything's gonna go well. Yeah, if it's money, then they'll probably be lenient. Yeah, I'm. I mean, I'm assuming it, that's the common, you know, that's the, that's what should happen. But yeah, that doesn't mean that it exactly will. But yeah, yeah, I get what you mean. Yeah. Okay, so we're running a bit long here. So we have one more thing. So uh, with the holidays coming up, I think it's right that we ask uh, old, old Saint Nick, old Mister Santa Claus, for, you know, one gift. I have just one thing on my wish list. Um, I want to see Khabib versus Ferguson. I don't care how shitty the cards in 2019 are. I don't care what happens with ESPN. I don't care if Connor comes back, if Nate Diaz. I don't care about any of that. I just want Khabib versus Ferguson. Um, I'm even telling you this now, UFC. That card can be absolute shit. That card can have nothing but contender series guys and newcomers and fucking Elias Theodoru and Gian Vilante. I don't give a fuck who's on that card. You can add nobody's there. You don't need to waste a lot of money. Just please make sure that Khabib and Ferguson make it and please just let them fight. That's all I want. That's all I want for 2019. Please, Santa, give me, give it to me. 
What about you, Irene? Um, my wish is for Chris Cyborg to be released from the UFC. Wow. Win yeah. or lose? I just want her to be able to be released so she can either try boxing or go to Toto or maybe even one. But there isn't anything for her in the UFC. And there's no division, really. She's the only one. Yeah, she didn't have time to build it up. Yeah, she's the only one still listed, and she's 33 years old. Yeah. You know, she tried with the UFC. You know, she finally got this fight after months of waiting. We're finally going to see this super fight. I hope she wins this fight, and then she gets released, so maybe she can try out boxing. You know, she's done the Muay Thai. She's done the, the MMA. Yeah. She's done grappling. Hopefully, she can now, still in her prime, go and entertain you know boxing and make more money and just retire because what is she going to do in the ufc i mean do you see anything happening with the featherweight division next year i don't no, i mean i mean okay so on on the card next week so obviously she's fighting nunas um if she loses shit i mean if she loses this might be even worse because who knows if nunas is going to stay up there and even if she does stay up there who's she going to fight like I don't think I don't see the incentive for Nunes to stay, even if she wins. I guess the rematch, yeah, but I mean it is the last fight in her contract. Yeah, I mean you're right. It seems likely, and it seems possible that that can happen. But on that card, there's the only other featherweight fight, not counting the tough thing because that doesn't really count. And this whole year and probably the whole history of this has been. Megan Anderson versus Holly, uh, Holly Holm. And now Megan Anderson is going to fight Kat Zingano, another bantamweight. And if Megan Anderson wins, I mean, I guess theoretically she could get a title shot, especially if it's impressive. But I have a feeling Kat's going to run her over. And this isn't me just because I love Kat. Like, I just think it's a bad style matchup. So Kat against Chris, is that going to sell? Is that... I love Kat Zingano. I I love Kat Zingano maybe as much as you love Chris Cyborg, Greena, but I'm not an idiot. I know what's going to happen there. Yeah. And frankly, I don't want to see it. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't want – I really do love this cat. I don't want to see her severely hurt, but I know – yeah, because she has a, a chance. Of course she does. Everyone does. But she doesn't have a bigger chance than Yana Kunitskaya or Tanya Evinger. Or, I'm, I'm realistic enough to admit that. Yeah. And I mean, Bellator may not have the greatest fighters, but at least they have fighters. She still hasn't fought Julia Budd, regardless of. Um, I've had my issues with Cyborg, but I will say, if she beats Julia Budd, I will not be the least bit sad because uh, Julia Budd is uh, the Ben Askren of women's MMA. Yeah, so I mean, I don't think they'll allow that a crossover, or mm-hmm. you know, I mean, Bellator Horizon, they're doing that, but. I don't think Dana will allow that with Bellator. So, I mean, what is she going to do? Just sit on the shelf? And I think there's a, a champion clause, too. Like, she wins this. Yeah. She's locked in. I forgot how many months, but how many fights. But yeah, she's obligated to stay. So, and you, you, know what? you know what? Not to, not to, uh, I don't want to walk on eggshells here, but I, I will address it. Also, Usada. I'm not saying this, oh, I want her to go to Ryzen or way so she could start roiding or something. I, I, I know that Cyborg has been clean for years because there, I don't think there's anyone who's been tested more than her. Um, I, I don't have any doubts that she's competed clean since her failed drug test years back. But I'm I'm really not saying this to be crude or to be an asshole of like, oh, well, she could start juicing. And that. like, no, it's, I you know, she already kind of had that flub with, the, the diet pill or whatever happened with that weight cut and the retroactive TUE, like what what reason does Usada have to be friendly to her? She's already failed once and you know how they how they can be with people who already had a failed test. You know, like she can go to another promotion where not just dealing with Usada as far as drug testing and stuff, but just that whole I think I'm starting to think that that may be an issue with fighters, um leaving UFC is like they need to know everywhere where you are I'm not comfortable with that and I'm not even fighting you know yeah 
you know, the, things like that can be an issue too. And like I said, it's not 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 because of her history. It's like her history has a, something to do with it because they may be unfair to her. But just on general principles, like, do you really need that behind you? You know, other companies aren't going to care. They're definitely going to gloss over what had happened. And, you know, even if they're just being fair about it, it's like, well, you've been clean for years now. So if we are going to drug test you, it's not going to be that comprehensive. So we could still have you be clean and make sure of it without knowing every single step you take. Yeah. 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 She was she was dragged through the mud before she got in the UFC. Mm-hmm. She was dragged through the mud while in the UFC. Dana's been cool with her lately, which is great, but because who else does he have left? Right? She's endured so much. They know she's a draw, but again, there's no opponents. So what are you gonna do? Yeah, and what's Cyborg the, is what's the next super fight gonna be? Cyborg is rare too because she she you know, people say this with like Fedor, where they want to believe with Fedor that he's a draw, that, oh, you know, he's never fought in the UFC, but he always gets eyeballs. By hardcores, Cyborg, yeah, okay, Cyborg is a, maybe a hardcore, she's kind of a niche in that way too, but I know people who don't watch fighting, who really don't care too much about the UFC or fighting in general, but they know who Cyborg is and they will pay to see her fight. In the same way with like Connor, like, oh, I don't really care about the UFC. Oh, Connor's fighting? Oh, I'll get that. There's people like that with Cyborg. Like, you know better than anybody, Rain. Right? Like, you know, I'm not lying. Yeah, she has like a cult following. I mean, she's yes, been around for years. Yes. You know, she she is that face of MMA. She fought Gina Carano in that yes. Wars card, like one of the major fights that they had, main event. Yeah. You yeah, know? that Carano fight, I'm sure, is still big in people's minds like oh yeah like there's people who there's people who probably loved Carano who became cyborg fan you know not not many but there's probably people who became cyborg fans after she beat her like wow this girl's fucking good she's real she's violent she's exciting she's legit and you know I remember when Invicta had her like Invicta events were not Invicta events when cyborg was fighting it was something else oh yeah it was um, it's still a big deal when she fights yeah, so no. she, she doesn't, I don't think she needs the UFC, and she probably never has. Yeah, This didn't hurt her, obviously, to join the UFC and get her name out there a little bit more, but she's always had her fan base. Yeah, it's a real treat to watch her fight, especially now because she's not that brawler anymore. She's a technical fighter. Yeah, even me, I, I, that was my big thing. Even after I kind of let the steroid thing go and stuff, I was like, well, she's None. She doesn't do much for me because she's just some crazy brawler. But then I'm seeing like, no, I can't deny the skills that she has because you can see, you can see her thought process, you can see how she's working, you can see what she's doing, and and it's all it's all sound and it's all fluid. And uh, and I definitely give her props. She she learns well. She's a good pupil. Yeah. She's not, she is a martial artist. She's not just this violent, you know, brute that I thought she was. Yeah, and she's done other you know combat sports so it's yeah. allow her to do boxing now can we just allow her to do that because there's nothing in the ufc for her. and women's boxing is growing right now i mean they're you know i mean even heather hardy got back into it for a minute and you know i don't i don't know i think i know a lot of people know of clear clarissa shields and honestly cyborg trains with her but there's other badass girls right now uh, break house um my fa- uh, uh, Katie Taylor. And my favorite, Michaela Mayer. That girl's not getting almost any attention. And if people know her, it's probably just because they think she's pretty. But Michaela Mayer is way more than a pretty face. That girl's, she's mean, she's aggressive, she's active, and she's technical. I I, I love watching that girl fight. Like I'm I'm day by day becoming a bigger women's boxing fan. And having a girl like Cyborg can never hurt because she does have skills and. She's definitely going to be exciting too. Not yeah. she's not just going to bring the fan base. She's going to bring excitement. Yeah. So I hope I don't know with this feud with Dana White and Oscar De La Hoya, maybe he'll actually step into the boxing arena and, and maybe have like Zufa boxing and put her on the pedestal. But when is that going to happen? 2019, 2020, 2021. What, what are it's we looking be- at? 
it can be interesting too because I mean I guess they can always do something on UFC Fight Pass, but um, ESPN already has a deal obviously with Top Rank. You know, they had Terence Crawford and Lomachenko and all these guys. So would that be in conflict conflict with Top Rank to have another boxing promotion in uh, in ESPN, mm-hmm. or would they just go the bypass route and if they do and they have someone like cyborg or they start signing signing big name fighters what's that going to do for fight pass and what's that going to do for boxing and for the u.s i mean they can really change the game in more ways than one big time yeah so hopefully we'll get some answers after this fight coming up and we can talk more about it but yeah that's really my wish list like for her to move on to something bigger because she's done all she can and All that is done. what she wants yeah. too. Yeah, it's not just what you want. She she's said that too. That that's what she wants. Yep. So I, yeah, yeah I'd be cool to see that. So I think it'll blow up too. It's, I mean, if you have somebody like her, yeah, enter yeah. into that arena, it's going to be huge. So, yeah. like I said, not just a name, but exciting. So she can bring in new fans too. You know, you can, you know, someone like you who's a big fan is having it, and you have a friend who probably doesn't know much about it. Like, oh. I like boxing. Well, yeah, we'll check this girl out. She's going to fuck shit up right now. Watch. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Irene. Um, any other thoughts, questions? No, that's it. I'm just really, I'm just excited for the, the last fight coming up, you know? Uh, two, 2.32. Yes, sir. So. Yeah, man. I mean, we went extra long on this one because it's 20, but, you know, end of 2018 and we got to, cover quite a few topics, but uh, I'm sure we're going to talk ad nauseum. Jones, Gustafson, Cyborg Noons. <sighs> yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And um, yeah, um, we're still trying to schedule guests. We have uh, people in mind. We hope uh, everything works out soon. We got a guest soon on here, maybe even next week. So uh, keep your eyes Keep your eyes open for that. But for right now, we just hope you guys enjoyed this episode. If you've made it this long, I really appreciate it. Um, follow us on Twitter, as always, at iFoxWithJuice. Instagram, same. Me at uh, Juice underscore MMA on Twitter and Instagram. Reen at Fox with you, Twitter and Instagram. Uh, always, you can catch us on iTunes, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, uh, basically anywhere you can find podcasts we're basically there so uh, thank you thank you sorry thank you for listening happy holidays and uh, wish you guys all the best cheers cheers